Welcome to the Velvet Room. My name is Igor. I am delighted to make your acquaintance. Persona 3 evokes a surreal feeling that still resonates with me today. It's a mysterious title that makes you reflect not just on your own personality, but your own mortality. Following the positive reception of the high school setting presented in Shin Megami Tensei If, Revelations Persona was born as a spin-off in 1996 on the original PlayStation. Persona 2 Innocent Sin followed by Persona 2 Eternal Punishment are a duology that was released in 1999 and 2000 respectively, taking place in the same universe. While Revelations and Innocent Sin saw their PSP remake released overseas, the same can't be said for Eternal Punishment. These three titles introduce the concepts of the different masks known as Persona that sleep within the sea of our souls, the demons that oppose them, as well as the residents of the Velvet Room. Hey there friends, so good to see you. The Persona is a series that is near and dear to my heart. To say that the third entry changed my entire perspective on games as a whole is not an understatement. The Persona series isn't simply JRPGs about high school students learning to use the power of monsters and demons to fight shadows. Uh, it's also a look into the psyche. It's a unique weaving of Charles Jung's psychological theories, various religions, uh, tarot cards, mythology, and many references to literature. In a literal sense, it takes the concept of personas being a mask that we use to face challenges and obstacles in our lives. These contrast against our own personal shadows, which is conceptually the emotional blind spot of the psyche that we constantly and internally are at ends with. That's only a very basic introduction to the works of Jungian psychology, and sets the conceptual foundation that Persona is based on. Following the first three titles, Persona 3 was released in July of 2006, and saw an international release a year later in August 2007. Back then, however, the series was rather niche. I only got into it because of multiple friend recommendations. Even at the time, Atlas was hard at work making more complete versions of these games. That led to the expanded version that I got introduced with, Persona 3 Fest. Fest as in... Festival. Fez added a lot of new little features and upgrades. The main base game known as The Journey was paired with a new epilogue titled The Answer. You pretty much had no reason to pick up the original title since this edition only expanded upon it, making it the definitive edition at the time. But this wouldn't be the only time that this game got an expanded version. Arriving on the PSP in November of 2009, Persona 3 Portable was yet another release that included more enhancements and additional features. After the critical acclaim of Persona 4, this version was given features to align it better with its successor. This was an exciting time for the series, as it was getting put on the map and its fanbase was steadily growing overseas. However, while Persona 3 Portable gave us plenty of additions, it did take some things away and compromises had to be made. Ask someone who has played both Persona 3 Fest and Persona 3 Portable which one they prefer, or which one is their definitive edition, and you may just get a different answer from each person. Now that Atlas is giving us ports of the PSP version, you might be wondering what you're gaining or missing out on if this is going to be your first time diving into this entry. If Persona 5 has been your only experience with the series thus far, there might be some aspects you'll miss, or changes that you'll be thankful for. But by far the most pivotal difference between these versions comes in the form of a new protagonist that you never saw in the two previous iterations of Persona 3. And let me just say... I hope you like the color pink. There are some very unique differences between the PS2 version and the PSP version. I'm not going to tell you that you're right or wrong by preferring one or the other, although there might be some bias. This is me telling you what Persona 3 is, what's unique to the PSP version, mixed in with some thoughts and feelings on both titles. Despite their differences, I want to relate to you a reason to give Persona 3 Portable a chance. Let's start from day one. Persona 3 Portable allows you to choose the gender of your protagonist as you begin your game, and you can name them whatever you like. This series has a bit of an issue when it comes to the canon name of protagonists, often changing them between official manga, animated series, live action plays, and even just universally agreed upon fan names. You're uh, just gonna have to deal with what I call them in this video. While the original title follows Makoto Yuki, who I call ever since the four part animated movie adaptation, you can also choose to play as Kotone Shiomi, who I call since it was her first official name in a video game, Puzzle and Dragons. Wow, I can't believe I actually mentioned this mobile game here. Gotcha titles are a blessing and a curse, man. Picking the male will give you an experience that mirrors Persona 3 Fest very closely. But if you choose female, you'll be notified that this may appeal most to veterans, as there are elements that change and give you a new perspective. Our look today will follow Kotone, but no matter what version you play, the opening remains practically the same. Your character is commuting and on their way to a dorm that they'll be staying in, accompanied by some rather alarming imagery if you have no idea what the context of these guns are. Just what are we getting into? On the way there, everything turns wickedly green and eerie. 
As you enter the dorm, you're asked by this young boy to sign a contract with your name. Yeah, get used to little surprise visits from this kid. Shortly after, you meet two girls, one who was putting that gun to her head earlier. They welcome and assist you as a new transfer student to Gekko Khan High School as a junior. But things seem a bit suspicious as no one seems to acknowledge the kid who had you sign the contract or the creepy darkness. Putting those mysteries aside for now, this is where much of the game is introduced to you. This is something that we really have no choice but to address early. Uh, in the original Persona 3, you were able to freely move around the map. You could explore areas, though small, but you can actually see the characters on screen. However, for the most part, the PSP version did away with that exploration. On the map, you'll be introduced to a point-and-click method of navigation and interacting with your friends and NPCs by selecting them with a cursor. Because of this, your conversations will be simplified into one or two character portraits with a simple background. This gives the game quite a different look and feel and becomes very comparable to a visual novel most of the time. If the visual novel genre is something that you're a fan of, or at least used to, then this might just be a small compromise. If you're somebody who can't really stand the idea of forming all the scenarios in your head with these cues, then this might be a deal breaker. But to a person that has no context for the original games, I can say that it's fairly competent in painting the scene for you. I will say, at the very least, it may be worth your time to look up the original opening sequence. Unfortunately, the animated cutscenes were also cut and spliced into static reels which, while their absence doesn't take too much away, it still stings to be missing out on them. You know how some JRPGs will front load a lot of animated cutscenes to introduce you to the world? You see this more often with modern games, and Persona 3 is just as guilty of this. Many of them are translated fairly well to dialogue in-game, but there will always be that something missing for fans of the PS2 version, like when you're being introduced to the school. Your arrival at Gekukan has you meeting several characters that you'll be interacting with throughout the course of the story, some exclusive to the female protagonist route. Speaking of, you'll notice by now that the majority of this soundtrack has been changed for Kotoni's route specifically compared to Makoto's. It has this chill but energetic vibe that fits her very well, whether you're exploring the city or in the school. And at this school, you'll be meeting some who will eventually become your party members, like Junpei here. I like how no matter what gender you choose, he'll still treat you like a bro. Hey, it works out for the writers and he's plenty in character. This game runs on a calendar system that starts in the spring, and progression of the story will be constantly tied to the days of the week and the time of day. Once the game opens up to how you want to spend your free time, you'll have to think carefully about what you want to do. As it tells you very early on in the game, you'll be given about one year, and time is limited. But honestly, it's best not to stress about how you spend it, especially if this is your first time with Persona 3. We'll be taking a dive into the social aspects a bit later. The first few days will be dedicated to learning about the main characters in the story, and just an appetizer for your soon-to-be daily life. You'll have minor opportunities to explore and talk to others, and it looks like you'll be in for a fairly normal life. But that piece flips on its head, and you'll soon come across your first taste for battle, as your dorm gets attacked by something... big. This one scene in particular is something I feel is essential to set the mood for Persona 3, and the one I feel hurts the most by excluding the animation because this, this right here was incredible to watch back in 2007. After you see the protagonist awaken to the power of Persona in Portable, I recommend you look up this scene online as well. It's still just so raw and stimulating to see. You basically can't lose in this tiny introduction to battle. After the fight, Kotone passes out for over a week and pretty much awakens to find out that they want you to lead the Specialized Extracurricular Execution Squad, otherwise known as Seas. Their goal is to defeat shadows like the one you just fought. You are told that the mysterious darkness you saw that first night is part of an extra hour that only those with the potential can see after midnight, known as the Dark Hour. During this hour, shadows prey on people and is believed to be connected to the phenomenon known as Apathy Syndrome, rendering many citizens into soulless husks around the city. This is a lot to take in guys, can, can you just give me a moment? After Junpei joins you, Mitsuru and Akihiko introduce you to what is believed to be the source of the shadows. During the dark hour, Gekukan High School transforms into this enormous abstract building that reaches high into the sky. Not long after your first outing in there, the game begins to open up and allows you to spend time as you see fit. But before we get into daily life, now is as good a time as any to discuss how battles work, as you'll be spending quite a significant amount of time in this structure. Welcome to the Tower of Demise, known as Tartarus. The long climb begins here. The core of exploration and battling happens in Tartarus, where you'll be ascending up many, many levels of randomly generated floors. At set floors, you'll battle with a mini-boss, and eventually you'll reach a dead end. But after a full moon, this path will unlock and you can continue your ascent until you reach another dead end after several floors and a few mini-bosses. This process repeats and is how you'll be leveling up. As for battles themselves, well fortunately Persona 5 has been on most platforms and consoles at this point. Uh, so people who have played that have a bit of a frame of reference to go off of. 
By the way, the whole thing about putting a gun to your head? Prepare to see that. A lot. Shadows appear as these gooey blobs in Tartarus, and you'll battle them once you make contact. You can attack them from behind for a preemptive strike, but if you get hit from behind, you'll suffer a loss of a turn. Thankfully, there's no random encounters here. You can use regular attacks or stronger attacks with your persona. You'll use SP for magic and HP for physical attacks, so you'll have to be constantly aware of your party's health. Your main goal in battle usually comes down to hitting your enemy's weaknesses, which will knock them down and grant you one more move. Knock down the entire group of enemies and you can initiate an all-out attack. But you have to be vigilant, as your enemies can trigger your weakness and give them one more turn too. There's ways to prevent this, like increasing your evasion, accessories to help you avoid elements, and tactics like defending to negate an enemy's extra turn. And then comes one of the major differences between Persona 3 Fest and Persona 3 Portable. I could have just started this off with, you can control your party members and end the video right there. No, no, wait, wait, wait! But there's more. By going into tactics, you can choose to select your teammates' actions, including controlling them. Persona 3 Fest only gave you control of the main character, leaving you to rely on your partner's AI to act on their own. There's some people who say this is the best thing ever, and then there's some that say that this ruins the core experience. I've always found that to be a bit of an exaggeration. You can control your teammates, but it doesn't give you so much power that it breaks the experience. And if you really want to have the original Persona 3 gameplay, you can have them set to act freely. In fact, the default is your party acting freely and independent until you change it. If you're curious as to what that's like, you can totally leave them to do their own thing. But if you do, please set them to something other than act freely, or else they may end up using less than optimal tactics. Just don't let someone tell you that controlling party members ruin the experience, because the original gameplay is right there by default. Your teammates will battle using their single persona and set of skills. You, on the other hand, can switch between multiple personas for different skills. When you visit the Vela room, you'll be able to fuse new personas together, and you might spend a significant amount of time here. Another way to earn personas is through shuffle time that may happen at the end of battle. By selecting the right card during this minigame, you can even get bonuses like more experience or money. Your main character becomes the most versatile piece in the game. Just keep in mind that you carry persona stats and weaknesses as well as skills. If they're a low level, you're gonna run the risk of a game over. And oh, what a cruel game over that can be! If your main character falls in battle, then that's it! Even if your other party members have an option to revive you, you're done. That can really suck, especially if you're caught off guard by an enemy getting multiple turns off, or, you know, getting destroyed by an instant kill attack. That's never fun. Did I mention this game can be just a little bit difficult? Thankfully, there's more difficulty options that you can choose from at the beginning of the game, but you can't choose it once you lock it in, so choose carefully. Luckily, you'll be able to activate access points to pick up where you left off in Tartarus throughout the tower, so please save, and often. Personas will level up separately from you, but they'll gain skills and abilities to make your battles easier. Later in the game, your teammates will gradually learn more actions that are unique to Persona 3 Portable, like the chance to follow up attacks together, taking a mortal blow for you, or surviving a hit that would have otherwise knocked them out. And you can earn cards to use powerful skills in a limited quantity, like Cadenza. You used to be required to have specific Personas with you in order to perform these in Persona 3 Fest, but that restriction has been lifted and adapted to an item instead. Another new facet in Portable is that sometimes a person will go missing and be trapped in Tartarus. By saving them, you can earn rewards from Officer Kurosawa. There may even be times where it's one of your social links that are trapped, so you definitely want to save them or bad things will happen to them. Although I will say, it's annoying that whenever you find them, you're forced back to the entrance of Tartarus, meaning that any progress you made climbing up will be reset. They could have at least put me back in the floor I found them on, but well, what can I do? You can also upgrade your weapons and armor. You can buy some at the police station, fuse personas into a special weapon, or find rare ones in Tartarus. Some that even change your appearance like... Oh. Alright, listen. I did equip the, um, risque armor sometimes, but only because it was the most powerful armor at the time. Even your party members will call you out for dressing them in some of the weird attire in this game, and I, I just... You know, we're not gonna show what this looks like. We're moving on. Somebody's gonna get beat with the Atlas stick. <laughs> you eventually come to learn that the major boss battles occur when the full moon comes out. These provide the most progression in the story, and are unique locations that are usually outside of Tartarus. Your team will be reminding you to train and level up to prep you for these battles, and it can really make all the difference. You might consider splitting your team up while exploring so they can get experience faster individually, as opposed to being on a full team. The EXP system is a little wacky, I know. Full moon bosses can get pretty brutal later on, but you can absolutely handle it. Leveling up is pretty integral to the progression of the story, but you cannot forget your friends. Your social life provides a very important part of the game, from making personas more powerful, to creating bonds that can quite literally last a lifetime. 
The whole power of friendship might be done to death in certain games and anime, but Persona handles it in one of the most elegant and natural ways that I've ever seen. The leap from the Persona 2 duology to Persona 3 is the most radically different of all the mainline games in the series. This is mostly due to the calendar schedule, and a system that lets you really get to know the cast of characters, both within the main cast and a fair amount outside of it. These are known as social links, essentially the same as confidants in Persona 5. They are each associated with one of the major arcana, meaning you'll have about 20 characters to form a bond with. By meeting certain requirements, you can spark a new friendship. On certain days of the week, you'll be able to hang out with a character and deepen your relationship with them. They each have their own schedule, as do you, and are only available on specific days of the week. You'll decide who to spend time with when you're available, and might have to leave some friends hanging when they want to hang out. You're the protagonist after all, you have to be popular. When you're out with a friend, you'll be given several opportunities to respond to their actions or questions with a set of replies. More often than not, your answer will make these little happy notes pop out, and they're not there just for show. You can think of these notes as points, and you'll have to reach a certain amount to reach the next level of your social link the next time you hang out. Some choices will get you none no matter what, while certain replies will get you more than others. Each social link has 10 levels, and can only go up once per hangout. Don't be too intimidated though, as some will increase automatically with the story. There's some differences in Persona 3 Portable, however. On Makoto's route, you can only have social links with the girls in your party. But with Kotone, you're able to have a social link with every single member in your party, guys and girls. INCLUDING THE BEST BOY EVER, KOROMARU! Who wouldn't want to be best friends with him? You'll even meet some characters that are entirely unique to her path, like Sayori and Ryo. Even someone like Shinjiro can be a social link, where you get to see a whole other side to the guy. The Fool Arcana, which represents the entire Cease team social link, will grant you bonuses in battle like the aforementioned team up attacks and allies taking blows for you. These two are features from Persona 4 that were carried into this title. Want an early tip? Always try to have a Persona in your possession that matches the Arcana as the one you're hanging out with. If you have Alp while hanging out with Yukari, for example, you'll gain one extra point for each positive reply you give to her, potentially maxing out at 3. This way you can progress social links as efficiently as possible. You really want to try and answer characters with a reply that you think they'll resonate with best. Some are definitely easier than others, like Junpei here. He's very carefree, and it's easy to go along with his playful banter at the start. This is intentional, as he's one of the characters to introduce you to how the social link system works. But later on, you'll meet characters like Hidetoshi, who refers to you to be blunt and curt with your answers. You might not respond the way that makes him satisfied in real life, but that's what makes him gain respect for you through his character arc. Would I say that someone got what they deserved when getting punished for breaking the rules? Probably not, but this game shows you what kind of people might exist outside of your comfort zone. As the game tells you, a persona is like a mask to help you get through everyday life. We may have to wear different masks around different people, and that's okay. Different people have different personalities, and we may have to adjust who we are to get to the day, whether it's in a professional or a casual environment. And it's an important distinction to say that we adjust who we are, not change who we are, because at the end of the day, it's still that real you behind the mask. It's impressive how Persona 3 Portable's translation to a visual novel format just feels so natural. Those who have an interest in the genre might be very familiar with these kind of scenarios. And there are aspects that lean into dating sim territory as well. Relationships with some characters can be strictly platonic or lean towards romance if you want to pursue it that way. And yes, both protagonists can pursue romance with multiple characters. It's in Persona 4, it's in Persona 5, and there's just something amusingly bold with letting Kotoni have as many relationships as she wants. There are some controversially problematic aspects of this that are better chalked up to poor writing and translation, but that's its own topic. The social links aren't the only thing you can do in your spare time. There's the option to spend it working on your own personal stats, like charm, intelligence, and courage. You know, like in real life. I'm charming, but am I dumb? You can study at night instead of going to Tartarus, and eventually level your intelligence to the next rank. There's an arcade to visit that can boost your stats or your personas. You could work part-time at a cafe and level up multiple stats at once. These stats help unlock more social links that require you to have a certain level of courage, for example. Having high intelligence will impress your schoolmates by getting top marks in class for exams, which in turn will make you more charming. All of these elements just kind of flow and weave fluidly into each other. And by the way, you will have to actually pay attention in class. I felt like my brain expanded so much learning random facts in these classes, some I could even remember from my own time in school. 
Or you could spend several minutes of your life trying to win this Jack Frost doll that for some godforsaken reason does not want to get grabbed by this money devouring cream that gives you way too many tries to get a single one. This is not gambling, this is required to give to Elizabeth or Theodore in a request, not just one, but three of these stupidly adorable creature plushies. Oh my god, I want this to end. Why are you like this? Oh. Two more to go. Speaking of Elizabeth and Theodore, they'll sometimes post requests for you to show them around the city. And if you see this, please do them. They're essentially the same character with some differences in their dialogue. But the way they have no idea how the world outside the Velvet Room works makes for some of the funniest scenes in the entire game. You can take him seriously or just completely mess with him and he'll take it in earnest. Theo is a strange, lovable dork and we love him for it. Persona tends to really take their time introducing their characters. Atlas is not shy about gradually fleshing out the world, and I've seen people who've had their gripes about it being a bit slow at times. But there's this natural feeling I get when these characters talk. There's something about the writing where, even at the time, it felt like I wasn't just talking to NPCs or the next spot on the map to interact with. These are roommates, they're friends, they're people who have a daily schedule with their own problems and hobbies, just like me. They are like living, breathing characters. Is it sad to say that some of the characters in Persona are better friends than the one I have in real life? Maybe, but who cares? Because it's all about what makes you feel happy. And there's nothing that makes me more happy than this sweet bean right here. Seriously, for being silent, she's such a fun protagonist, and I have friends who told me how cool it felt to play a JRPG of this magnitude with a female lead. I mean, listen to Kotone's battle theme. Right there in the song, it says, You don't gotta tell me, girl. She's not a princess. She's a queen! A queen! So what other reasons would you still argue for Persona 3 Fest or Persona 3 Portable? In summary, Fest has fully explorable areas. You're able to view characters in cutscenes, and it has an epilogue. Portable has the original game with Makoto, and a new path with Kotoni that introduces new story beats. You can have a social link with your whole team, including entirely new characters, controllable party members in battle, and some quality of life improvements. But the vast majority of the story is told in the format of a visual novel, and the epilogue is not included. The thing is, I don't think one is a downgrade over the other. The way that the explorable map is a point-and-click selection in Portable has been really divisive. For someone who has played this game before, this is a much faster way of getting from one place to another, but some people might really appreciate and miss that tactile feeling of running around in the world. Combat can be completely player controlled, or party members can be left to the AI as with the original. It really depends on your own personal preference. When you consider all the new content that's a part of the main story from Kotoni's perspective, Portable arguably has more content to offer than Fess, but we still haven't directly addressed the epilogue. In short, the answer takes place after the events of the main story, labeled The Journey in Persona 3 Fess. Without spoiling the main game's plot, which is really tricky to do if this is your first exposure to Persona 3, it makes Aegis the main character who can now enter the Velvet Room. You are guided by a new character, Metis, who accompanies you down the Abyss of Time, which is structured just like Tartarus. On the bright side, you get a lot more time and backstory for the members of Seas, as well as a look into Aegis' character development. On the downside, at least for me and some others that I've asked this about, the answer is really hard. At its core, the gameplay is Tartarus and only more Tartarus. There's no school life, no social links, and no day-to-day -day calendar schedule. Your Persona compendium in the Velvet Room gets entirely wiped, and now the fusion combinations are completely rearranged. You can't immediately rely on any old favorites you might have used in the main story. Shin Megami Tensei games can be quite difficult, and this mode is some of the hardest content you can find in the modern Persona games, partially because there's only one single difficulty option. If you play Persona 3 in any shape or form and you find yourself curious as to what happens beyond the main story, uh, I can honestly tell you, j just find the scenes online. Not because Persona 3 Fest is the more difficult version to secure a copy of and play, but because I don't think pulling your hair out to beat some of these bosses is honestly worth the struggle. I've beaten the 25 or so long hour campaign and I don't really want to ever do that again. The epilogue story is fascinating and does deserve a watch, but if you do happen to secure a version of Persona 3 Fest and want to do the answer yourself, then Godspeed to you. Persona 3 has given me such a roller coaster of emotions and continues to do so every time I play it. And honestly, I didn't think I would even stick with it my first time around. After playing Fest on the PS2 for about 10 hours or so, I stopped, partially for reasons and opinions about the game that I still have today. 
Because of its structure, you only really progress the story when a full moon appears in the first stretches. The time in between can provide story beats, but it mostly lets you do whatever you want with the social aspect when you're not exploring Tartarus. To put it simply, there is quite a bit of dead air in between that time, and it can be draining. I stopped around the time that Fuka disappeared right before the next full moon and stepped away for a pretty long time. But the more I thought about it, the more I told myself, well, maybe it gets better. I want to see more of these characters. I want to know what happens. So one day I picked it back up and kept powering through. And let me tell you, the story gets very good in the latter half and leading up to the end. I'm pretty sure at this point I'm a bit spoiled by recent Persona games because the pacing of the story was immensely improved with Persona 4. Just something for you to keep in mind if this is your first time playing. Would I be happier if Atlas just combined the positive improvements of Persona 3 Fests and Portable together into some definitive edition? Oh hell yeah! But does it need a full-blown remake to look like Persona 5 or something similar? Um, uh, no? Many of us have seen the argument of redoing all the visuals as we've seen in Dancing in Moonlight. And to some extent, I agree, it's still crazy to see them in such high resolution models like this. But honestly, the game can be remastered from the PS2 version with a playable female route and I'd be happy. The structure of the game is already set in stone, there's not much of a way to change it after two revised versions. In just my opinion, I feel like the game is fine as it is and is just a product of its era. I wouldn't say it needs a remake, but there's always going to be rumors. And we're bringing this up when there are games that deserve a remake much more than Persona 3, and they're just... sitting right there. What are you doing, Atlas? I'm just so glad that Persona 3 Portable can be played by more people now. Kotone has not been treated kindly by Atlas and deserves so much better than what she's been getting. Actually, can, can I just rant about that for a moment? She didn't appear in any of the Persona 4 Arena games despite the entirety of C's being playable, but Makoto also wasn't there because of plot reasons, so I understand that. But you did see everyone in Dancing in Moonlight, even him! So why not at least let her be a downloadable character or something? For crying out loud, you can dance as Theodore to music that plays only in Portable Story that they remixed just for this game. Do you not see something wrong with this? She's also not in Persona Q, which crossed over Persona 3 and 4's cast together on the 3DS. It's like she just sort of never happened? She's also not a secret boss the way that Mokoto and you are in Persona 5, which I think could have been extremely cool. Then there's the fact that Kotone does not appear in the Persona 3 animated movies since, well, she just wasn't the focus. Her canonical existence was more or less just banished. But it has gotten better. Kotone did appear in Persona Q2 New Cinema Labyrinth, where her charming personality is fantastically shown. I mean seriously, there's this part where she disguises herself as a cop, and then, when trying to pretend to be one, ends up just karate chopping and cuffing another cop, and then the Phantom Thieves themselves are all like, holy... Yeah, she will never leave my 3DS home screen. Kotone was also prominently shown during the Persona 25th anniversary, being displayed all over promotional art and merchandise. As she should be! It's nice to see Atlas acknowledging her fans more now, because she is my favorite Persona protagonist. As with Maya from Persona 2 Eternal Punishment, the series can do female leads in a game very well, though she's technically a dual protagonist with Tatsuya. Will Persona ever get a solo female lead one day? We can hope whenever Persona 6 happens. Persona 3 was introduced to me in a pivotal part of my life and helped shape the kind of games I grew to love. It's a rare game that made me realize things about myself and the people around me. Like a good movie, it kept me thinking long after I rolled credits. I'm sure you've met some individuals with a unique perspective on life. Persona games are a wonderful mix of well-written characters and personalities that all help to build a world that feels like it's living and breathing. They are some of the strongest character-driven stories I have ever played, and the overall narrative of this entry hits strong. It's quite literally the phrase, Memento Mori, which can be translated to, remember that you are mortal. The deeper you dive into it, the more the message resonates. We all live on limited time, and we should do what we can to make the very most of it. That is absolutely one of the messages that, by the end of the game, grabbed me by the shoulders and shook me, telling me, you're not going to be in this world forever. And it's so perfectly represented in a game where you have just a limited amount of time to do everything, like maxing out everyone's social link. I told myself in-game that I should have spent more time with you, and then it hit me pretty hard. It was a shockingly adjacent feeling to me thinking, man, I wish I spent more time with this friend in high school or with that friend in college. Because I've lost contact with some of them now. Everything that we do, the impressions that we give, the people that we spend time with, the legacy that we leave, the, the time we have for that is very finite. And Persona 3 honestly helped me grow as a person. 
I felt those changes in my daily life, from wanting to connect with my friends more often to even just studying a little bit extra every night. That text box that you see over and over that says you should probably study tonight, it just kept nagging at me over and over, especially when I was in high school and college at the time. But then I told myself, you know what? Maybe I will sit down and study a little bit more tonight. We all resonate with games differently, and I think this game helped me grow in a healthy way. Will it do the same for you? I don't know. But it never hurts to try new things, right? It's just a way of life. And that concludes my quick look at Persona 3, and why I think Portable is definitely worth playing. If you're still here, thank you so much for watching. This is one of the series that I am majorly attached to, and it's made my heart happy to see it grow so much in popularity since I first started the journey on PS2. Now we can finally move on to arguing about more important things, like how to pronounce Persona 3 fees. As I mentioned earlier, we've been a bit spoiled by what Persona 4 and 5 has given us, so I hope you can give Persona 3 a fair chance. This is exactly like when you recommend a show and you're like, you gotta watch the first few episodes before it gets good. It's thankfully not as full price as it once was, so hopefully it's gonna encourage more people to give it a go. You know what's the best part about this game being on Switch? It's still Persona 3 Portable! If you want to check out more videos like this, you can subscribe to our channel, hit the like and ring the bell for notifications. We've got a Twitch channel at OfficialGVG, and just for a dollar on Patreon, you can join our illustrious group on Discord, where you can tell me what your favorite persona is. It could be a game or an actual persona you summon, as as uh, long as it's not one of those spicy ones, like, the, like one of the reasons this game is rated M. You know the one. Alright team, that's it for now. Good luck out there. Till we meet again.